getting going here in a minute. <coughs> Called the study session of June 20, 2022, um, joint session DDA quarter studies uh, to order at 6 p.m. If everyone would please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible. With liberty and justice for all. <coughs> okay, if we can have roll call, please. Certainly. Council persons do pray. Here. Higgins? Here. Kelsey? Here. Ross? Here. Salcedo? Here. Tobin? Here. And Mayor Carnes? Here. Okay. Well, here we are. And uh, we have uh, Carl Malish, who is our EDA and EDC Executive Director. Uh, Carl, I'm going to turn it over to you, sir. Thank you. Um, yeah, first of all, I want to thank the council for scheduling this uh, joint work session. Uh, it's joint among, uh, and they were invited officials of the City of Lincoln Park, obviously. Our council is all here. Uh, E-Course, uh, they were involved in this. And we also have in the audience members of the Economic Development Corporation of City of Lincoln Park and the Downtown Development Authority, uh, City of Lincoln Park. Uh, invitations were also extended to the Planning Commission of the City of Lincoln Park. Anyway, um, we um, have with us tonight our consultant team, and they are going to give you an update and brief you on where uh, this whole study and plan is headed. Uh, first of all, there's a, uh, one entity, uh, one topic, and that's the Southfield Road Corridor Study and Plan. That was a uh, plan that was funded uh, completely by the state of Michigan Department of the Treasury thanks to our city manager's connections uh, with Treasury. Uh, that's, uh, that element costs uh, the state about a over $100,000. Uh, that study is supposed to be looking at land use, building conditions, traffic, roadway, other physical characteristics uh, in the reach of beginning at the Allen Park, Lincoln Park uh, city limits, through Lincoln Park, through E-Course, to the Detroit River and West Jefferson. Uh, another study that has been done in conjunction with this is a, a transportation study, traffic equity study more specifically for the 4th Street Corridor, uh, which is the, essentially the heart and soul of the, our downtown. And that reaches from Outer Drive all the way down to uh, Champaign. And uh, we have tonight, as I said, uh, our consultant team here. The consultant team is led by Beckett and Raider. You're all familiar with Beckett and Raider. They've done quite a bit of planning for the city over the last several years. Uh, Liz Gundon is the lead planner on the project, and he sh she is here with us tonight. In addition from Beckett and Raider, we have um, Brian, uh, Brian Barrick, who's a landscape architect. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, he's one of the principals of Beck and Raider. Is that correct? Yep. Okay. Um, and then we also have uh, uh, the uh, delight to introduce Shannon Silty. I probably messed that up, didn't I? I didn't? Okay, <laughs> great. She is also a landscape architect, and she's part of the consulting team. One other name that you're probably familiar with, Christy Summers. She's also part of the team, but she had a previous engagement, so she is not here this evening. 
In addition to the Beckett and Rader folks, we also have Lori Adams here. Uh, she is a principal and one of the uh, honchos that runs uh, the traffic engineering firm CGI. They are located in Toledo, very close, obviously, to the Michigan border. And uh, she's very uh, adept with um, MDOT, uh, as well as ODOT, I guess, right? Is that what they call it? Yeah. OK. And Anyway, uh, I'm going to turn this over right now, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to Liz, and she's going to kick off this, uh, this review and slideshow of what our consultants have come up with. Um, I would ask you, um, you know, sometimes there's a burning question and you need clarification uh, at the moment. Go ahead and shout out your question. I would ask the people in the audience, though, uh, to hold your questions. Uh, and when we do uh, receive questions later, we need you to identify your name, your affiliation, and then tell us what your question is. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Liz. <clears throat> thank you, Carl. And thank you all for being here. I want to reiterate um, what Carl said. That, um, we appreciate your time to do this study session tonight. So just a brief overview of what we are going to talk about. Um, first, we will give um, an overview and general findings of the Southfield Road Corridor Study. Um, I'll briefly go through some zoning rec recommendations. Um, but won't go into great detail because those are pretty technical. Um, and then um, Brian will talk about the design recommendations. Then we will jump to the Fort Street Corridor, give an overview, and then Brian will talk about the design recommendations. And then Lori will go into the traffic analysis and study that happened for both corridors. There should be plenty of time at the end for questions, um, so we look forward to that. So starting with the Southfield Road Corridor, um, just an overview of some of the project objectives. I know many of you have been involved in this process the whole time, so this is likely a repeat, but just, just want to refresh your memories. There were three goals for this study. The first is to inc increase the consistency of the built environment along the corridor. Second is to improve its economic return. And third is to facilitate mo non-motorized access to its businesses and recreation assets. General findings. Um, so we, we took a look at existing conditions and did some ex uh, quite a bit of community engagement last fall that many of you um, participated in. Um, so just as a summary, the majority of the corridor, um, as Carl mentioned, it spans from Allen Park all the way to the Detroit River and Ecorse. But the majority of the corridor hosts commercial land uses. Um, in, in some areas of the corridor, we have deteriorating building conditions and high vacancy rates, especially in the middle section um, in both Lincoln Park and Ecorse. There's limited vegetation along the corridor. Um, there is lighting. It's, to, it's mostly auto-oriented, so if you're a pedestrian, there really isn't much lighting as you're walking along. There are regular bus stops, um, but most of those are, are just signs, so limited amenities like um, shelters and benches and then um, limited pedestrian crossings. So in terms of, of zoning, we did a comparison between Lincoln Park and Ecorse because this study spans both communities. Um, there are, let's see, 13 zoning districts amongst between the two communities, but um, the majority, almost 80% of the zoning districts are either the municipal business district in Lincoln Park or the commercial um, commercial district in ECOR. So that's those zones, the commercial zones, are really the focus of the recommendations. Um, in general, the uses permitted between the two communities are pretty similar. Um, just the format that are presented is different. In ECORSE, um, ECORSE's zoning ordinance was updated um, just a few years ago, and Lincoln Park is about to update it, so this is, will be a prime time to sort of align, align the two communities. Um, but in ECORS, there's a table, whereas in Lincoln Park, it's more cumulative, so long lists. Um, so one recommendation is to, um, you know, make, have, make the Lincoln Park ordinance more of that tabular format to align with ECORS. Um, 
while the commercial uses are pretty similar between the two communities, there are some differences. So um, because the corridor spans the two communities, it would, it would be beneficial to make sure that those commercial uses are, are aligned. Um, and then there are some differences in area regulations, so like landscaping and architectural standards. That would be, um, it'd be beneficial for those to be more similar. I'll go into um, brief detail of some use recommendations. Um, the team met with um, a, a group called um, Recast City, which talks, which we we're talking about small scale manufacturing. This is an emerge emerging industry and sector, basically people who make things. Um, so we're recommending to sort of focus that general corridor area in both Lincoln Park and Ecorse um, to allow for small scale manufacturing uses. Um, in Ecorse, in Ecorse's zoning ordinance, residential uses are allowed in the commercial zones, but not in Lincoln Park. Um, so we're recommending considering um, mixed use, residential and commercial uh, along the corridor, and also consider permitting um, high density housing by right on the corridor. There's a national housing, housing shortage. Um, so this seems like a prime opportunity along there. And then we have automotive, quite a few automotive uses, like shown in the in the image there. Um, there, the automotive uses are are there and um, probably are not are not going anywhere, but they could improve um, their visual effect. So, you know, adding use specific screening or additional landscaping standards and enforcement for those types of uses. For site development standards, um, like I said earlier, aligning. Aligning the standards between the two communities would be important. Um, one way to do this would be um, to establish sort of an overlay that goes, spans the whole corridor, but applies to both communities. Um, then you're not wrestling as much with minor discrepancies between the two community zoning ordinances because you are dealing with two jurisdictions. Parking um, in Ecorse, there are parking maximums, where in Lincoln Park, there are minimums. So, recommending changing to maximums in Lincoln Park. And then, access management. Um, Lincoln Park's ordinance has quite a few, has a pretty extensive access management section. Um, so, sort of working between the two communities and using that as a base. Um, in, in a way to to make those those access management standards uniform between both Lincoln Park and Ecorse. Then finally, landscaping. Both communities have landscaping standards, but there there are differences. So, um, standard, standardizing those landscaping and screening requirements, and then also implementing triggers in the in the development review process that would require the the improperly paved lawn belts, like shown in the upper right photo, um, to be replaced with landscaping. And finally, review procedures, um, allowing for administrative review when, when appropriate to expedite the, the review process, um, determining what development standards are priorities, and then finally, a big one is strengthening and prioritizing enforcement in both communities. So we can have these standards, but they need to be enforced. So that was a very quick overview of zoning recommendations, but I will let Brian go through some of the design recommendations for Southfield. Thank you, Liz. So we will, uh, as Liz mentioned, we'll begin on Southfield Road, and we'll start uh, with a little bit of the big picture and then drill down into into a little bit more detail. Please keep in mind that this is a, a conceptual study, so we're presenting general ideas and general design concepts that will ultimately need to be flushed out further during uh, future implementation phases. Uh, this diagram is uh, is of the South Southfield Road corridor with uh, Dix Highway on the left side of the diagram and then the Detroit River and Jefferson uh, in Ecorse on the right side of the diagram. Uh, Fort Street is roughly in the middle, just a little bit to the left of middle. And uh, as, we, as we talk through this for purposes of, of understanding, we divided the corridor really into three different design solutions or design typographies. Uh, the orange section on, on the left uh, really occurs between Fort Street and Dix Highway, 
where the where Southfield is a uh, divided roadway with the center green median and then east of Fort Street uh, we have what we're calling typology 2 and typology 3 which are, uh, are are really variations on the theme currently it is a five lane roadway plus uh, additional curb use lanes on either side and uh, actually I'm going to go ahead and flip slides here so through the through the course of the study, uh, DGL has has looked at traffic volumes and uh, and created a traffic model, which uh, which Lori will come up here in a little bit and talk in a little bit more detail about. But the uh, the root outcome of that is that on the east on Southfield east of Fort Street, the roadway currently has excess capacity, meaning that there are more travel lanes uh, there than what are needed to adequately flow traffic. As a result, that gives us the opportunity to essentially do a road diet, uh, a five lane to a three lane road diet, and create other opportunities for on-street parking, uh, protected bike lanes, and, uh, and pedestrian improvements. So that, uh, as, as Carl mentioned, we're looking at transportation equity and balancing all of the transportation uses within the corridor, uh, vehicular, bicycle, pedestrian, et cetera, and, uh, and transit, public transit as well. So, in this uh, in this snapshot, which is uh, a, an enlargement just east of Fort Street, uh, we're, we're looking at transitioning from the uh, five lanes on the left to a three-lane cross section on the right, meaning a center turn lane, and then one traffic lane in each direction. And if I zoom in. A little further here you can start to see that transition uh, towards the right of the diagram you see those three traffic lanes on street parking and then on the outer edges of the roadway at the existing curb line inserting uh, protected bike lanes so uh, bike lanes and then there's a, a buffer strip in between the bike lane and the parking so that uh, that parking and the buffer serve as a uh, both a perceptual as well as a physical safety barrier from moving traffic and in cross-section uh, it looks like this so the the upper cross-section is the roadway as it exists today you can see the center turn lane uh, and then moving outward from there two traffic lanes uh, in either direction and then a uh, a curb use lane which in various locations sometimes that's uh, that's uh, facilitates parking or uh, or bus stops or uh, or just no parking zone so that that varies as it goes through the corridor but you can see that in that cross section in some locations that curb use lane is is extremely wide uh, so we can utilize that that pavement space uh, without moving the existing curbs uh, and repurposing that in as you see in the cross section below so again a center turn lane and then one traffic lane in each direction uh, a parking lane the buffer strip and then the bicycle lane on the outside adjacent to the existing curb. Now with the steering committee, we explored a few different options for the, for the buffer strip. Uh, the quickest, easiest, cheapest, but probably least impactful option for that is to simply do road, roadway striping uh, to stripe out that, uh, that buffer area. Uh, a, Next step up from that, slightly more costly, but also more positively impactful, is to again use striping, but then uh, use a, a series of, uh, of pylons or bollards to delineate that, uh, that buffer area. And then the third option, uh, the most costly, but clearly the most impactful, is to, uh, is to 
use raised curb islands uh, that could facilitate landscape stormwater management and those raised curb islands could also be the location for uh, EV charging stations to serve the on-street parking spaces and actually I'm going to go back a slide and there you can on the right side of the diagram you can see in plan view what we were just describing this drawing uh, illustrates the uh, the buffer space using the striping and then the little black dots are the uh, the pylons or the bollards that would serve as uh, as vertical protective barriers Can I ask a question absolutely um, I don't see on that map uh, the parking that's in the middle of Southfield is that part of the plan to stay it is uh, so the what we're talking about now would be east of Fort Street um, and we'll talk about uh, that area that you're speaking of in just a moment yes but yes the the direct answer to your question is that that parking is proposed to stay okay so uh, east of Fort Street there are two locations where the roadway existing roadway narrows down uh, due to uh, obstructions uh, one is the the bridge at Ecorse Creek and then the second is the uh, the railroad overpasses in in Ecorse so at both of those uh, locations the roadway next down in width and that's what this uh, this typology illustrates here so uh, we essentially maintain the same idea of having the protected bike lanes on the outside edges of the roadway adjacent to the existing curbs using the protected uh, buffer strip areas and then three lanes of traffic um, the center turn lane and the, the one travel lane in either direction uh, the only difference here is that due to that that constriction of the roadway we are essentially dropping out the the uh, on-street parking lanes for those short distances uh, where we're going over Ecorse Creek and going underneath the railroad bridges in Ecorse. And so here you can see that uh, that cross section uh, existing on the top with the five travel lanes, and then the proposed on the bottom with the three travel lanes, the buffer strips, and the protected bike lanes. Uh, so again for this area east of Fort Street uh, between Fort Street and Jefferson at the Detroit River uh, there are currently five uh, five regulated crosswalks meaning and by regulated I mean that they occur at signalized intersections that's quite a distance with only five crossings so in order to to improve that condition for the pedestrian give give more permeability from north to south and south to north looking at opportunities to add uh, add regulated crosswalks uh, those can occur at existing intersections and in some instances occur at mid-block crossings and at those mid-block crossings uh, the traffic analysis shows that uh, using rectangular rapid flashing beacons uh, which is the photograph on the bottom right of this slide uh, these are essentially pedestrian uh, initiated signals where a person uh, crossing the walkway would put the push a button the uh, signals and the overhead signs uh, will flash alerting drivers of pedestrian pre presence and improving safety for those crossings uh, at the existing crosswalks there are opportunities to reevaluate signal timing so we increase the amount of crossing time that pedestrians are allowed currently uh, the timing the pedestrian phase of the signals is is very short and it's uh, it's difficult for people to cross the full width of the roadway before the pedestrian phase expires uh, so uh, we will be looking at improving that in the center image the center vertical image of this slide you'll see a yellow line uh, which essentially follows the e-course uh, 
Creek, as well as the Electric Avenue corridor. Uh, thinking about non-motorized plans, uh, SimCog has uh, developed some long-term uh, priorities of which the Electric Avenue corridor shows on their diagrams. So thinking about uh, that as well as the Lincoln Park and E-Course uh, priority of developing a recreational trail along the E-Course Creek, uh, essentially creating a loop uh, through the community that connects numerous parks, uh, schools, daycares, etc., as well as the critical services on Fort Street and Southfield. Uh, so that that would occur and then the crossing of Southfield would occur at the uh, at the mid-block crossings that I mentioned with the uh, RRFB signals. Uh, talking about protected bike lanes, this these are example images of what those might look like. Uh, on the far right is, uh, is an image with uh, a striped buffer area and then where the, that bike lane intersects driveways or roadway intersections, it would receive the, the green uh, pavement marking. So that's, uh, uh, that's an awareness for uh, the non-motorized users as well as drivers alike that, uh, that there is a bike lane there and to watch for those non-motorized users. Uh, the top center image is the bike lane with the uh, with the bollards or the pylons. And then the bottom center is the raised curb island that I mentioned that uh, could serve a stormwater management function as well as a location to house uh, EV charging stations for the on-street parking. Uh, transit uh, and pedestrian amenities uh, throughout the quarter be looking to improve sidewalk conditions. And as Liz mentioned earlier, in instances where there are encroachments into the right of way and into the sidewalk environment, looking to enforce those scenarios so that we provide uh, consistent landscape through the corridor as well as uh, contiguous uh, pedestrian sidewalk facilities without having vehicles uh, parked over the sidewalk. Uh, looking at improving transit amenities, uh, benches, uh, shade, uh, concrete pads at uh, bus stop locations, providing accessibility for those users, and at the uh, through further analysis, identifying the the bus stops with the higher the highest ridership, and looking to install uh, shelters at those locations. So typology three, uh, this would be the, the area that, uh, that you just asked about uh, between Fort Street and Dix Highway, where, uh, where the roadway has the center, uh, the center landscape median, or in the case of downtown, the, the center uh, parking lot area. Uh, looking to, to maintain those, uh, those uh, median uses. And then looking to improve uh, pedestrian connectivity and non-motorized assets. So right now, uh, there are a couple gaps in the sidewalk connectivity, specifically on the uh, eastbound uh, route underneath the railroad bridge. Uh, there is not a pedestrian sidewalk underneath that railroad bridge now. So for people to safely get from one side of the railroad bridge to the other, they would need to cross to the, to the north westbound lanes and, uh, and use the sidewalk that's over there. Uh, the sidewalks are also currently uh, about five feet and looking to, uh, to widen those so that they can serve as shared use non-motorized facilities. Um, enlarging this uh, a little bit, again, we, did, we performed some traffic analysis, and uh, Lori will talk a little bit more about that uh, in a few moments. But underneath that railroad bridge, uh, there, that is currently a dedicated right turn lane to the I-75 ramp. And our analysis has shown that uh, because that is a right turn only free flow movement, that we can we could actually get rid of that 
that turn lane, at least the small section of it that is underneath the railroad bridge, uh, which would allow for pedestrian connectivity, adding a new sidewalk there. Uh, and then that turn lane would pick back up again as it's underneath the I-75 overpass. Uh, in this particular section, there is uh, a, an existing right turn lane between uh, the I-75 ramp and, I'm sorry, I just blanked out on the name of the road. Um, what was that? Lafayette. Lafayette, thank you. Thank you, appreciate that. Uh, so that dedicated right turn lane between I-75 ramp and Lafayette, uh, we could also reclaim that for additional uh, landscape space and to enhance redevelopment opportunities of, uh, of the parcel uh, along that section of roadway. Uh, that uh, also allows us to narrow the crossing distances and uh, enhance the pedestrian crossings with, uh, with some of the RRFB mid-block crossings that I had mentioned. So again, looking at increasing the, the frequency of, of pedestrian crossings. Uh, what might that look like? Uh, the photo on the top left uh, for the railroad bridge as well as under I-75 I overpass. Looking at opportunities to enhance those, uh, those underpasses with uh, pedestrian sidewalks, murals, uh, pedestrian barriers uh, or physical barriers in between the sidewalk and moving traffic. So in this particular example, uh, that takes the, the form of a, of a decorative, decorative rail. Um, for, uh, for Lincoln Park, we would suggest a decorative uh, retaining wall with a decorative rail on top of it. So again, just uh, providing that, that physical barrier between the pedestrian environment and the vehicle environment in order to improve uh, non-motorized comfort for those users, uh, as well as lighting, uh, looking at lighting beneath those bridges and railroad overpasses and the same for the railroad bridge and e-course uh, opportunities for sculptural artistic lighting uh, that is also functional and uh, and the idea of the, mur the murals to uh, lighten and enliven that space. So moving, uh, moving towards Fort Street, uh, we will show you the same sort of conceptual ideas. Uh, for Fort Street as we just looked at for Southfield. I should mention that we had some late breaking news uh, Thursday, Friday last week that uh, we had a conversation with MDOT that was very positive and there may be more opportunities to alter the cross section of Fort Street uh, at least north of Southfield than what we had previously thought. So very good news. Uh, we'll show you our preliminary thoughts that we had developed prior to that conversation and then I will talk a little bit about uh, how that might alter our thinking moving forward. Um, so actually, I'm just going to fast forward here a little bit. Uh, again, the length of, of Fort Street looking at inserting some additional pedestrian crossings uh, using the, the RRFB signals. And then uh, immediately north and south of Southfield Road, there are two Michigan lefts. Uh, MDOT, uh, we understand, has, has changed their guidance on Michigan left configurations since the point in time that, that Fort Street was constructed. So we believe that there may be an opportunity to, to remove those two Michigan lefts that are immediately north and south of, of the intersection and reclaim uh, some of that to enhance the, uh, the direct downtown environment, uh, which also uh, reduces some of the vehicular conflicts that, uh, that occur in that location now. So for, uh, again, this, what I'm about to show you will continue to apply for Fort Street south of Southfield Road. 
the conversation that we had with MDOT does not does not affect south of Southfield Road. So again, what I'm what I'm describing now will still apply. Uh, having three travel lanes in each direction, and then the curb use lane, looking at better defining that than what it is today. So looking at uh, creating defined parking zones, uh, defined bus stops, and using the buffering techniques that we talked about on Southfield Road uh, in, this, in a similar fashion. So striping buffer zones, using uh, using pylons or, or bollards to, to better define those areas and creating some, uh, some pedestrian bump outs in strategic locations to reduce the crossing distance, uh, the crosswalk distance uh, for, for users crossing Fort Street. So this, uh, again, is a cross-section of, of what that looks like. The top is the existing condition with three travel lanes in each direction plus the curb use lane. And then the bottom section is showing repurposing uh, that curb use lane to better define parking, bus stops, etc., and reducing the pedestrian crossing. So no, for north of Southfield, our conversation with MDOT uh, revealed that we may be able to reduce uh, a travel lane in each direction and still accommodate the, the necessary volumes of traffic in, in that portion of the corridor. So what we're intending to explore moving forward is the idea of creating uh, a buffered or protected bike lane similar to what you saw in the, di in the graphics for for Southfield Road. So that is not a foregone conclusion at this point, but is something that uh, with MDOT's uh, new information that we will be continuing to explore. Uh, also during this process, MDOT uh, approached the city with, uh, with some coordination for replacement of the Fort Street bridges over uh, Ecorse Creek. Uh, they approached the city with a proposed design uh, for the southbound bridge uh, and possibly increasing the width of that to accommodate five traffic lanes. Uh, we felt uh, as, a, as a group of consultants and as a steering committee that this was uh, really counter to the idea of transportation equity. Uh, so we're suggesting that the the bridge uh, essentially remain the same width that it, as it is today. And uh, there's currently a Michigan left turn lane uh, that crosses that bridge. That turn lane could be shortened and still provide adequate uh, stacking space. And that would allow uh, that, cur that drive lane to be eliminated from the, from the bridge. So that would allow the bridge to stay the same, essentially the same width as it is today. So with that, I'll, uh, you've heard me talk a lot about traffic analysis and the results of that, of how we can <coughs> repurpose some, some drive lanes. And Lori is, uh, is much more capable than I of explaining why that is. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. So before we, uh, before we look at some more details, um, we did come and uh, we counted traffic throughout the corridor. Um, every every signalized intersection um, from Dix to, to the river and then from the entire Fort Street corridor. Um, and the key to this whole thing is the Southfield Ford intersection is really the, the, the linchpin of the entire of the entire study because it sees the most traffic. Um, and we are working with MDOT. Um, anything that is done on these trunk lines does have to have an MDOT re approval. But like Brian said, the meeting we had last week certainly uh, gives us hope that we can do uh, some of these road diet items because we think they work. Our traffic models show that they work. Um, 
but we wanted to con to confirm that they would allow that to happen and and they seemed very receptive to that they said they're doing it in other in other locations and they are with some of their resurfacing projects they are um, having communities are asking for bike lanes and, and different things so it was very it, it was a very nice uh, a very nice meeting and we're looking forward to to working with them a little further so what we decided to do is we looked at whether the road diet would work whether some of these uh, elimination of lanes would work um, you know what would be the best thing to obviously we need to keep traffic moving um, it, during the peak periods but we also want to have these this transportation equity um, you know how how do we make this all work and so what we thought was let's let's look at this road diet and then let's talk about if you're in a location how much shorter or longer time would it take you to get somewhere so right now the existing travel time in the corridor from from uh, I-75 to uh, east of the river of the Ecorse River is uh, about four a little over four minutes um, that travel time doesn't really expect to change and then where we looked at here was if, if I was on Dick's Highway and I wanted to get onto I-75 North um, what would that what would any of these changes do so the <coughs> existing travel time is a little over seven minutes it stays a little over seven minutes that's a four percent increase in travel time not significant um, to go from I-75 northbound ramp to Applewood Avenue a little bit longer time frame when we were when we're talking about a road diet but once you narrow that traffic down that's a safer a safer situation and um, I think that people would feel comfortable spending a little extra time getting somewhere knowing they were safer here is I getting off of I-75 northbound and and coming around and turning <laughs> south onto Fort Street and this in this particular instance uh, we are seeing a decrease in travel time and that's because we're changing some some lanes at uh, Fort Street approaching Fort Street and allowing allowing uh, extra movements to occur and that decreases our travel time and then this one shows us uh, I-75 off-ramp southbound so you get off the southbound ramp you turn right you make do the Michigan left and come back along Southfield Road and turn right and go on to uh, on southbound onto Fort also a decrease in travel time Let's see. and these are these are all during the p.m. during the p.m. peak uh, here's another alternative where we talk about southbound off-ramp to 6th Street a little bit longer time but that's when we're we're getting the longer times as you're coming into the road diet east of Fort Street. And Larry, you might just mention that when we're talking about longer times, we're talking about 30 seconds. Yeah, we're talking about, you know, 30, 60 seconds. This isn't like, um, you know, 10 minutes or, or a lot of extra time. Does anybody have any specific traffic questions they'd like to ask right now? Yeah. Where do you put the snow when you have a lot of snow to plow? Do you fill up the bike lanes with it or the parking spots? Well, <coughs> yeah, thank you for that question. The, so the, the protected bike lanes, uh, we have, we've proposed those at, uh, at critical widths so that uh, snow removal equipment can access those. And uh, just like uh, just like the street is today where you have a road edge with a sidewalk adjacent to it uh, you know that snow needs to needs to be pushed uh, you know pushed away the same instance occurs with uh, protected bike lanes and with the buffer space uh, that's created between those and the parking lanes or the travel lanes that actually presents a little bit of an opportunity for snow for snow storage but how do you get around those barriers between the bike lane and the, the bike lane and the road tubes to plow that? Right. So the so the width of those uh, between the curb and those barriers is wide enough for a snow removal vehicle, uh, so that we're not necessarily removing the snow in between each one of those bollards, but there's 
there's uh, snow clearing of the bike lane on one side and then snow clearing of the roadway on the other side. So you have to have special equipment to clear the bike lane, right? No, just standard uh, standard pickup truck snow yeah, equipment. The, the snow plow will force snow into the bike lane? It would be clearing snow from the bike lane. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think you understand me. The snow plow goes through. Correct. And it pushes that snow right into the bike lane. So you, then you're going to have to make another clean pass and clear that bike lane up. Otherwise, that that's bike right. lane isn't going to be usable until May. That's right. That's right. So both the roadway and the bike lane get cleared of snow. And the city's going to have to buy special equipment to clear that bike lane. No, a standard pickup truck snow plow can, can clear that. Trucks. We don't have pickup trucks on our plows. <coughs> yes. My question is, I know you, you're calling them protected bike lanes and then the, the additional uh, um, pedestrian paths with, with barriers. I'm still concerned about those, the, the safety of the pedestrian and the safety of the, of the bicyc bicyclist, because the speed limit is still high. What does MDOT say about that? Yeah, so the, in, in Michigan, the process for redefining speed limit is, uh, is a speed study, which is actually conducted by the Michigan State Police. And uh, they use what, what's called an 85th percentile rule, meaning that they conduct a study, measure the speed of traffic as it flows today, and set the speed limit at the 85th percentile of the speed that they measure. Uh, so it, with, with speeds that you see today, it's probably, and this is just me making inference, uh, we haven't studied it in detail, but if, if vehicles are traveling quite a bit over the speed limit today, conducting that study would probably result in an 85th percentile that's actually higher than the speed limit that's out there today, which could actually raise your speed limit. So the, the solution to that is implementing, uh, implementing improvements that intuitively reduce speed. And then once that occurs, conducting a speed study may be more beneficial and achieve the result that that the community hopes for in terms of reduced speed limits. So the the improvements that you've seen here tonight of narrowing the perceived width of the roadway, mm -hmm. uh, adding adding defined parking spaces, the bike lanes, uh, additional crosswalks with the RRFB signals, those are all improvements that that help reduce that perceived roadway width and the perceived uh, I'll call it highway effect uh, so that so that drivers have a tendency to to slow down and be more aware of the environment around them and then like I said once once those improvements are in place then a speed study may be more productive so we wait for yeah. the speed study. Yeah. Is yeah. that what you've seen in other communities? It is. Okay. It is, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yep. Okay, great. Through the chair. Um, I question here and a question in the audience. Go ahead, ma'am. Um, so when you say the, the parking, are you talking curb parking, tires to per curb? Are you speaking of bumper to curb? Uh, tires to curb, so parallel, parallel parking. Parallel parking, mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Yeah. That's my, my question is, when you infer a speed study that was done now, that people are naturally going over the speed limit, is there a way to survey residents and people that use that road to make sure that they know it's 45 miles per hour? Because while I do see a lot of people doing over 45, I also see plenty of people you know, being pretty happy at 40 miles per hour. I know it's been 45 for quite a few years, but does everyone know that? <coughs> yeah, that's that's a good question, and there's certainly a community education component that goes along with all of this. So that's uh, that's something that would be very beneficial as we move forward. Okay. Yeah. Through the chair, if I may. That's correct. Uh, 
this might sound kind of weird, but MDOT doesn't have a very good uh, reputation in the city even cutting the grass. So how do we take trust in MDOT going to do everything you're talking about? Because the county controls Southfield as far as I know. It's not the city. So the county's going to have to come up with a pickup truck on top of a big plow to do what you just talked about, okay? Second of all, if you're, you're conducting, uh, uh, compressing the um, uh, lanes, Evidently, you haven't drove Southfield during the rush hour because you not only have heavy trucks, you have every imaginable vehicle you can name. And I drive Southfield, and it usually starts off of um, I-94 in Allen Park, and you get over in the right-hand lane because you're never going to get over until you get to Dix or Fort Street or the, I mean, Dix or I-75 because there's so much traffic. Now, you're talking about reducing that traffic. And am I correct? Because you're, oh, you're cutting some of the lanes out to make diet? Only, only east of of uh, Fort Street. Only east of Fort Street. So you're not talking what I'm talking about, right? Correct. Okay. Correct. The other issue is, and I guess the last issue is, is this, who's going to pay for this big project? This is going to cost big bucks. So somebody's going to have to, and different agencies. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you, who do you perceive is going to do all that? Yeah. So that's a, that's a very real question. Okay. Uh, these are, uh, as you know, these are long expanses of roadway. It's a lot of, it's a lot of distance. It's a lot of square footage, uh, big area. And it, that just by nature translates into big dollars. Um, the the city has already begun engaging uh, potential partners uh, for grant sources. Wayne County has has come alongside and has actually already uh, included some of uh, these potential improvements in a grant application that they uh, that they have done. And Carl has been uh, has been instrumental in. Uh, in shepherding those groups of people. So, uh, I, Carl, would you mind talking a little bit about that? No, that that's a, right. It's a it's a big project. You know, whether you're talking about Southfield Road or Fort Street, one of the reasons why uh, the consultants were coming up with different approaches to road diet was because some of the stuff could be just absolutely too expensive and out of the question. Or we'd have to wait for years, maybe decades, uh, to see money get put together. This is one of the next steps, okay? They've come up with some concepts. Uh, those things need, and they have cost estimates. And that's what we're doing now. We're trying to figure out, okay, how do we put together a program to implement these improvements? You know, it might be a matter of starting at ground zero, whatever we define that as, and, you know, going away from it, you know, just expanding outward with some schedule. But I'm glad that it was pointed out that uh, we have a real good conversation going on right now with Wayne County. And uh, Wayne County is putting together an application uh, to submit to the state of Michigan asking for some of its ARPA money to make some of these improvements or to fund some of these improvements. Um, you know, I don't know how that's going to pan out, uh, but that's a good place to start. Uh, you know, the, um, I've had some conversations with MDOT. Um, I, you know, I was thinking that maybe there would be extra highway funds put in through that infrastructure improvement bill. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in that bill that got passed by the U.S. Congress, but the funding for uh, transportation, with the exception of uh, mass transit, is about the same as they've been planning. So, you know, there's no uh, sack of cash coming down uh, for highways specifically. But, you know, there's other things we can look at. Uh, there's a, a transportation enhancement program that uh, both the state of Michigan and SEMCOG have, and we're trying to develop a good relationship with SEMCOG. In fact, SEMCOG is the entity that uh, funded our Fort Street study, 
okay? So we're building a rapport with them. And we've got some other ask in, into some kind for, uh, there was mentioned uh, something to look at trails on the Ecorse Creek. You know, that's an aside, but you know, we're, we're working that. But uh, there's this thing called Transportation Enhancement Program. And lots of the communities will take a bite-sized uh, thing that they want to accomplish in a downtown and ask for uh, TIP funding, or excuse me, Transportation Enhancement Funding uh, for that purpose. So we'll, you know, we'll get those things put together and applied for. Um, you know, next steps. Mm -hmm. You know, I, you know, again, I'm not trying to be critical, but there's, I probably got a laundry list uh, written down in my uh, notes here of next steps that we're going to have to do as a community to be able to implement what we want to see happen on either of those corridors. And, you know, you just can't do a plan, throw it on the table, and hope it happens. You've got to roll up your sleeves. You've got to do more cost estimates. You've got to seek out grants. You've got to develop internal strategies. Uh, you know, one, th one thing in particular, you see carnage along that Southfield Road corridor because of businesses that have cars parked helter-skelter in the right-of-way on the sidewalks. They filled in grass plants with asphalt. We can take care of that ourselves by developing an enforcement strategy to turn that around. So, you know, it's, you know, some things are going to cost lots of money. It's going to take some time. But there are other things that we can do uh, to have some positive results incrementally. There's also something else that's going on here. Um, you know, you've heard this in some conversations we've had. And there are zoning recommendations mm -hmm. that were briefly mentioned. We, um, we have a consultant selected, you've endorsed it, and we're going to get some financial aid uh, for that uh, zoning code upgrade from the Redevelopment Ready Communities Program. You know, people often say, what's that all about? Why bother? Well, because we're doing the right thing and we're trying to become best practices as a community, it's helped us to get some uh, funding access to help with some of the major things we need to do. So anyway, you know, um, I'm going to be quiet now. You probably have some other questions, but I'll, I'll run through about a half a dozen things later that would be next steps. Thank you. Thanks for explaining all the, because yeah. there's no free lunch. That what, that's what I was getting across. Everybody's going to come up to the through, through chair. Apologize. Everybody's going to have to come up, including the cities. And I'm just wondering where all the money. Grants are great, but you know, grants tend to go away after a while, and you still got to go and you know. But anyways, no, that, I appreciate you telling me. That's a good point. You know. I'll tell you one other thing about grants. Rarely do you get away with not having some local match. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Chair, you're right. the chair, if you don't mind. Yeah, go ahead. First an observation, then a question, but in regards to Councilman Kelsey, when you get off I-94 and head down east on Southfield Road, there's the street lights aren't really timed that well. There is a lot of backup. And I'm not sure you said the time is five or six minutes, whatever, but certain times of the day, you get stuck at every red light. But on the other side, going from Fort Street going north on Southfield, which is really west. The Tim Hortons backs up there. Have you guys considered that? Well, that's kind of a hamper there. In the morning, it gets congested. So I see that part of Southfield Road. To me, I wouldn't say a waste of time, but I would, I would concentrate more on Fort Street going towards Ecorse and Fort Street going north. Those two concentrate, concentrate areas, because I know you, you want, there's some other items in place currently on the north side of um, Fort Street of uh, Southfield. So my question is, that was just my comments on the traffic because I, I, I drive there daily. In regards to e-course, they have a bike trail, if I'm not mistaken, on Jefferson Avenue. There's no partitions that I noticed, but they have the, it's painted. Mm -hmm. So I could see a bike route going from Jefferson to Fort Street, maybe turning, you know, going towards Detroit, going north. So I, I do see that, and I do see the parking that you talked about. There's a couple car places where there's cars parked. That, that could be addressed. A lot of the businesses in that area, actually there's 
the facades could be improved, right? There's actually some businesses in that area. Mm -hmm. So the, I would concentrate on that area first because uh, going towards e-course, I think that would be a wonderful idea because that needs that needs work. Anything going north on Southfield Road, I, I, don't, I don't see that happening anytime soon. So those are my observations and really not a question, but that's my thought. Yeah, we, we concur with you that the section of Southfield east of Fort towards e-course and the section of Fort Street north of Southfield, I think are the, the biggest opportunities for transformative change. Uh, there are opportunities for improvements on the other two legs uh, as well, but they are not as uh, dramatic or transformative as, as the areas that you mentioned. Thank you. Yeah. That's all you're Okay. Well, we thank you all very much for your time. We've uh, we absolutely loved working on this study. It's uh, it's a lot of fun, and we uh, once once that vision is is in your head, it's easy to get really excited about, and and we're excited for uh, the city of Lincoln Park and the city of Ecorse, and the opportunities that this presents in the future. Uh, and we we hope to be part of it moving forward. So again, thank you very much for your time, and uh, appreciate. Uh, your input. Thank you. Thank you. Carl, do you have, you have next steps? And then we'll open yeah. up for additional questions. Yeah, just, you know, I was just jotting down a few things here. But these are the type of next steps that, that we have to go through yet. Okay, we the consultants are going to uh, re-examine the northern reach of Fort Street from Outer Drive down to Southfield Road uh, to see what kind of uh, road diet could make sense there, as you've heard. Okay, We're, they're going to prepare a final report. Um, the report uh, is going to be available and it ought to be adopted because it's going to be a plan. It needs to be adopted as an amendment to the uh, city's master plan. So that's something that'll have to be done. Uh, I mentioned the zoning code update. Uh, we will need to take the recommendations in this study and plan and incorporate them into the zoning code update. Um, and uh, you know, there's detail there that makes a whole lot of sense. Um, we want to uh, coordinate with eCourse probably in at least three things. Uh, number or number one, uh, they've updated their zoning code as I understand it. So not that you know we have to follow in lockstep, but we want to make sure that uh, you know that we're all sort of singing out of the same uh, hymn manual and that we're trying to accomplish the same outcomes. I haven't looked at eCourse's <coughs> zoning code. Uh, I'll just assume it's you know perfect at this point. Maybe not. We may have to have some dialogue and talk about that a little bit. A second item, um, I understand that eCourse has already designed uh, improvements to the Southfield Road Corridor. You know, they're, they're part of the Southfield Road Corridor is maybe 25% of the length. And they've already uh, engaged an engineer and they've designed these improvements and I understand they're going to be implementing them sometime soon. Well, that might give us a cue to follow in terms of what designs details that we get into. Remember, the plan is conceptual. That's all got to be drilled down into, at some point, if we get funding, construction documents and the like. Uh, one final item that comes to mind with coordinating with eCourse. eCourse, uh, and for that matter, um, uh, Wyandotte, uh, we all share the eCourse River. And uh, both communities, uh, eCourse and uh, Wyandotte, as well as Lincoln Park, uh, can work right now to put together uh, some ideas and plans and concepts and do the study for a uh, trail system uh, that ties together um, ability for pedestrians and non-motorized traffic to navigate along uh, eCourse Creek, you know, either in the in the creek or you know outside of the creek but we did apply to SEMCOG for a grant uh, to fund another traffic type study 
that would focus on uh, developing, you know, that network uh, and tying into it, you know, the school sites and parks and, you know, everything else that we have in the proximity and reach of Ecorse Creek. We've got to put together a strategy to start cleaning up our right of way. Um, you know, sure, you know, the businesses might uh, need to have some on street parking, but they don't need to have helter skelter, uh, cars, you know, just laced all over the, the right of way. Um, you know, how did these uh, grass plats get filled in with asphalt? You know, something may have happened. You know, we need to take a look at that, but we, you know, we can start doing that. There's nothing wrong with, you know, starting that motion. And then last but not least, and uh, Carlos Salcida actually mentioned this, I, I'm pretty sure. Uh, yeah, we need to look at uh, what we can do, what kind of private sector incentives we can put together uh, to help stimulate some positive outcomes with redevelopment and occupancy of these buildings on the corridor. The one thing that we don't want to do, and you didn't see this in the plan, is there's no call for wholesale, let's buy it and tear it down and start from scratch. Uh, that There'd never be enough money to do that, believe me. Um, we've got a built environment, they're humble buildings, but they can be useful for the things that we're talking about doing, small manufacturing, uh, occupancy uh, by uh, artisans, uh, you know stuff like that uh, so that could that can help uh, anyway those are some thoughts for next steps uh, I don't know if uh, Liz has any at this point but uh, do you want to conclude this do, does anybody in the audience have any questions I have one. yes go ahead with her yeah please state your name I'm and who you're Ann with Cleave. Um, I'm on the EDC I also own Al Petrie and Sons Bicycles and as far as bike lanes and your concern about traffic being so fast the way that it's set up right now people are riding in what we call a parking lane and then going out around a parked car and back in and cars are not leaving three feet that you're supposed to leave between a bicyclist and their car driving so it's much safer for them to be in a bike lane and then you've got your parking lane and then you've got your moving traffic also most of our businesses have their entrance to their their shops right on the sidewalk. I don't know how many times people have been just knocked over by a bicyclist walking out of our store because they walk right into that bicycle traffic on the sidewalk. So a dedicated bike lane would be much safer than the way any of it is set up right now. Just my Yeah, and we've, the consultant team has had conversations with PIAC and Mr. Walker, is it? Um, is that his last name? Waterman. Waterman, I'm Water sorry. Oh, Peak. Yes. It's Peak. Yeah, Peak. Okay, PIAC. It's, it's P -P an acronym, Program to Educate All Cyclists. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, Any other questions? Be extremely helpful. Yes, I had. I'm yeah. interested in how that section east of Fort Street was determined to be underutilized. I mean, what, what steps were taken to, to figure that out? Could you speak to the traffic modeling and you know how you determine that? Because you you not only looked at existing traffic, but you also projected. Yeah. Yeah. So when we when we did the counts, you can see a definite decrease in traffic once you get past, I would say, electric. Um, and so that that was the first step in determining that possibly a road diet could occur there. There there's some. There's some volumes and, and some recommendations as to when you might consider reducing lanes. And, and once we got east of Electric and north of Fort, or north of Southfield, I'm sorry, on Fort, you start to see those, you could start to see that traffic step down where it's starting to get in the ranges where you could consider that. Um, and then we did some traffic modeling to look at it. We can provide some videos once we get into this uh, final report stage. We can provide videos that we can you can put on website or, or SharePoint and everybody can view them that show th that show that this works based on the traffic that was counted. Did Gordy Howe Bridge cause any traffic shifts coming our way? Is it where is that all traffic? <laughs> when you read when you read the studies, it it makes it appear that it wouldn't, um, but 
you know, I'm sure, I'm sure we all know that when changes occur, there's always a shift. Same as you would have, you know, if something else happened. Um, but how, but I'm not sure how we will need to, we can look at, you know, if there's an increase in traffic of a certain percentage, would that road diet still work? Uh, we can consider that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and, and in the same vein as if I-75 hit an incident, people would still get off I-75 and, and try to use local streets to get around temporary, but it would be a problem for a short time. Well, when 75 was shot, mm -hmm. that section probably mm -hmm. had the traffic uh, doubled, if not tripled. During right, the so right. Questions? No questions? So final comments? Uh, Liz, did you have something? Yes. Hi, my name is Kevin Lee. I'm the general councilwoman for the city of Ecorse. Has any of this information been relayed to the city of Ecorse? Yes. About the Southfield corridor between the pieces that you were mocked up on your display? Yes, so. Um, <coughs> Yeah, so there was a there's a steering committee formed for uh, purposes of, of participating and informing this this process, and the the city of Ecorse was um, was participating within that steering committee. And Carl, did you have specific contacts that you wanted to mention? Uh, the gentleman that. Uh, Runs their finance department. I, I don't recall. Tim. Tim. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was. He's been working with you. Yeah, he's been in the loop, and um, you know, I I don't I don't know who has contacted the consultants would be able to answer that better, but um, uh, you know, they they had, <laughs> this wasn't done in isolation. There were. Uh, outreach made to get information. There were a variety of meetings. I don't know who attended what. I was primarily concerned with what the new, or excuse me, the Lincoln Park uh, contingency was involved in. I know um, there's members here from the EDC, the DDA, the Planning Commission. They were, you know, involved in uh, the background studies and gathering information and indicating preferences and things of that nature. Okay, you just confirmed that eCourse is not, is in the know, so that was my main concern. Yeah. So I will follow up with Mr. Sadowski. Yeah. Thank you very much, okay. Mayor, yeah. Council. I had a question. My name's Damian Bright. I'm a volunteer at the DEA. And so with this design that we're coming up with, like has there been or will there be conversation between the surrounding cities and like how the design is going to blend into those. For example, when you come into or leave the South Gate on 4th Street, when you come from the South Gate, you're like, yeah, the lines are, the lanes are huge. And then you jump into Lincoln Park and you feel like you're about to get, you get the scraped. You know what I mean? Like, so will there be like a, a blending of both worlds of Detroit, Allen Park, yeah yeah absolutely good good question yes there uh, as far as physical design in in the short term there be blending and tapers of of the design from one city to the next uh, the eventual hope would be that the non-motorized improvements that that the cities of lincoln park and ecourse initiate would be continued into into the other cities as well so that would that would certainly be the the long-term goal that we wind up with with continuous non-motorized corridors yeah, does that answer your question yes. okay um uh, my name is jason bear i don't know if this would apply to this traffic study specifically just read that part but the light at south building ferris which is just two blocks you know b sports d cars would this be classified under pedestrian and car safety as far as the possibility of installing a left turn lane light there would that fall under the purview of the traffic study or would that be a separate issue mm -hmm. yeah that's that's certainly something that we can look at within the model i can certainly attest to as a pe as a pedestrian and a driver how many personal close calls mm -hmm. i've had and 
how many people never stop at the amber light when you're trying to okay. make a left turn. And that would be eastbound? Yeah, Southfield and Fair. Okay. Okay, thank you. What? Thank you. It is the design group that looked at the corridor study of Southfield. Are they aware that Wayne County is in the process of presently designing a bridge? Uh, they're going to be doing a removal at the over top of the Course Creek? Yes, we were made aware of that. Yes. <coughs> yes, sir. Jordy Blue, Commander 552 Lincoln Park, VFW. Uh, from what I've heard tonight, it doesn't sound like you're going to take too much of the parking spaces between the, uh, uh, between the VFW and or 167 American Legion and the uh, Legacy Bowling Alley across the street. And I consider that that's pretty safe ground for our parking, because if it ain't, we're done like this. Yeah. You know? yeah, the, uh, our recommendations are that uh, that the parking within that general vicinity no stay as it is today. Okay, thank you mm -hmm. very much. You're welcome. Okay, anything further? A project like this takes a great deal of work and um, behind the scenes meetings and everything. So everything that you all have done we just appreciate it. Um, so we thank you for that. And with that, there's no further uh, discussion study session will be adjourned at looks like 7 16. See everybody in minutes.